Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. A former Special Intelligence Operations Officer who led an interrogations team in Iraq two years ago has written a stunning op-ed in the Washington Post. It's called, I'm Still Tortured by What I Saw in Iraq. In it, he details his direct experience with torture practices put into effect in Iraq in 2006. He conducted more than 300 interrogations and supervised more than 1,000 and was awarded a Bronze Star for his achievements in Iraq. In the article, he says torture techniques used in Iraq consistently failed to produce actionable intelligence and that methods outlined in the U.S. Army Field Manual, which rest on confidence building, consistently worked and gave the interrogators access to critical information. He writes, quote, my team of interrogators had successfully hunted down one of the most notorious mass murderers of our generation, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq and the mastermind of the campaign of suicide bombings that had helped plunge Iraq into civil war. But instead of celebrating our success, my mind was consumed with the unfinished business of our mission, fixing the deeply flawed, ineffective, and un-American way the U.S. military conducts interrogations in Iraq. I'm still alarmed about that today, he writes. He goes on to say that the number of Americans killed in Iraq because of the U.S. military's use of torture is more than 3,000. He writes, it's no exaggeration to say that at least half of our losses and casualties in Iraq have come at the hands of foreigners who joined the fray because of our program of detainee abuse. The number of U.S. soldiers who've died because of our torture policy will never be definitively known, but it's fair to say that it is close to the number of lives lost on September 11, 2001. How anyone can say torture keeps Americans safe is beyond me, unless you don't count American soldiers as Americans, he writes. Well, the former interrogator has just written a new book. It's called How to Break a Terrorist, the U.S. interrogators who use brains, not brutality, to take down the deadliest man in Iraq. The publication date for the book was delayed for six weeks due to the Pentagon's vetting of it. The soldier is writing under a pseudonym, Matthew Alexander, for security reasons. He joins us now in our firehouse studio. In one of his first national broadcast interviews, we welcome you to Democracy Now! Thanks for having me. It's good to have you with us. Why don't you want to use your name? Uh, it's just basic security concerns. You know, Al-Qaeda has promised reprisals uh, for the killing of Zarqawi. Uh, so it's just to protect myself and my family. But, you know, the, after the death of Zarqawi, the response was actually, I thought, uh, quite limited. It was less than what I would expect, and I think it goes to show how much even people within his own organization disliked him. Why was it so hard to get your book out of the Pentagon? I mean, you've got the book, you have to have, you have to hand it in to be vetted, but they wouldn't release it. Yeah, you know, I turned it in in the middle of July, and they're supposed to do the review within 30 days, and uh, they didn't do that. Uh, I missed the first printing date. Uh, when they finally did come back with a review of the book, uh, after two months, they had extracted uh, an extraordinary amount of material. There was 93 redactions uh, made. Uh, I used, uh, you know, I sued the Department of Defense first to review the book and then to argue the redactions because they had redacted obvious unclassified material, things that I had taken straight out of the unclassified field manual, and also some items that were directly off the Army's own website. Uh, so eventually, they acquiesced on 80 of the 93 redactions. Uh, and if you, uh, when you read the book, you'll see that the, the redactions within, uh, some of the redactions are still in the book because we had to go to print before we had the results of the appeal. So why don't you talk about your time in Iraq? Um, you were a chief interrogator. Explain how it works and what is a gator? Uh, a gator and interrogator, I mean, their job uh, within the mission is to extract information from detainees, uh, intelligence and useful intelligence information. And it's a timely art. It's one in which we're always under a lot of pressure to produce results quickly uh, because intelligence is, uh, is very time sensitive. Uh, and when I was in Iraq, I was in charge of a team of interrogators assigned to a task force. And our mission was to find Zarqawi. Uh, we believed at that time, at least our, our leadership believed, that if we could kill Zarqawi, we could slow down the path towards civil war. Explain who he is, who uh, he was. Well, Zarqawi, uh, he was an extremist. You know, he, he got his start as a thug in Jordan, uh, where he spent some time in prison. He had spent uh, time in Afghanistan, uh, two tours in Afghanistan. Uh, and he had come back to Iraq prior to our invasion to set up a resistance. 
And he was also the author of the Civil War in Iraq. He was the one behind the bombing of the Golden Dome, uh, Golden Dome Mosque that started the civil war between Sunni and Shia. And it was his idea that if they targeted Shia civilians in suicide bombing attacks, that he could bog American forces down in a civil war and force us to leave. So how did you get information about his whereabouts? Uh, well, the things that we used in Iraq is we took the methods uh, that had been used for uh, prior to our arrival, uh, and we changed them. The, the methods that the Army was using uh, were based on fear and control. Uh, and those techniques are not effective. They're not the most effective way to get people to cooperate. Uh, my team was a little bit different because we were made up of uh, several criminal investigators uh, who had experience doing criminal interrogations in which we don't use fear and control. Uh, we use techniques that are based on understanding, uh, cultural understanding, sympathy, uh, things like intellect, ingenuity, innovation. And we started to apply these types of techniques to the interrogations. And ultimately, we were able to put together a string of successes uh, within the Al-Qaeda organization that led to uh, Zarqawi's location. What does that mean, uh, sympathy? Those kind of um, using that approach? Let, let me just give you one example out of the book. Uh, there's a, let's go to the example where uh, I convince uh, one of Zarqawi's associates to give up a path towards uh, Zarqawi. Uh, this man was a, a highly religious man. He was uh, deeply schooled in Islam. He had spent 14 years studying Islam. And uh, we had tried f uh, fear and control uh, techniques on him for a period of about three weeks, and they didn't work. Uh, he had maintained that he had nothing to do with al-Qaeda. What was, do you mean fear and control? Uh, by fear and control, I mean using tactics uh, that are uh, basically uh, intended to intimidate uh, and in a detainee. You're not allowed with it, within the rules of interrogation uh, to threaten a detainee. Uh, but there's ways to create fear without threatening a detainee. And uh, those methods, although legal, are not most effective. Uh, the, the methods what are that, they? Uh, How do you inspire fear? Uh, you can inspire fear by, uh, you can state what are the consequences for someone's actions. You can say you're going to kill them if they don't talk? Uh, you can't say that you can, you're going to kill somebody if they don't talk. What you can say is you can state what are the punishments for a certain crime, and if that person's been uh, involved in that crime, uh, then the point will get across. Uh, I think that the, the JAGs, the military lawyers, the terms that they use is you can't put the dagger on the table. Now, if you look at the way we do criminal interrogations in the United States, uh, you can certainly tell a, a criminal suspect what are the consequences for a crime that they've committed or that you suspect they've committed. So that, I think, is a permissible uh, and ethical way to conduct an interrogation. However, it's not the most effective. Uh, the most effective techniques are those that rely on rapport building and relationship building uh, and then adapt that into the culture of the, of the person that you're interrogating. So talk now, moving from fear to what you did. Uh, what we did with is him. we got to know our detainees, first of all. You can't effectively build a relationship with somebody and convince them to cooperate unless you know them. You have to get to know what motivates them, uh, why they've joined the insurgency, why they decided to pick up arms against you. And then once you understand that, then you can uh, appeal to them and, and offer them some type of negotiation or compromise or incentive. And you know, the best incentives that we could apply were ones that were intangible, things like hope, uh, things like friendship, like respect, uh, like uh, wasta, which in uh, Arab culture is a term referring to status. Uh, you know, ultimately, uh, interrogation is just one tool we're using in, in this war. And we have to conduct ourselves uh, while, we're while we're doing interrogations according to American principles. Uh, if we don't, then we're not living up to the ideals that we proclaim to have. And for me, this war, it's more about preserving our American principles than it is about defeating al-Qaeda. We can't become our enemies uh, in trying to defeat them. Well, when we come back from break, we'll find out just how you got the information that led to the whereabouts of Zarqawi. We're talking to, well, he's calling himself Matthew Alexander, and that's the name on this book, but it's not his real name. How to Break a Terrorist, the U.S. interrogators who use brains, not brutality, to take down the deadliest man in Iraq. Stay with us.
change.